questions. I'm Eric Davidson. I'm the president-elect of the Biogeosciences section. This is the Carl Sagan Lecture, which is co-sponsored by Biogeosciences and Planetary Sciences. And it's my honor to be able to uh, introduce Pear Sellers. He told me he wanted me to give a short, well, now I think it should be very short, an irreverent introduction. Uh, therefore, I won't uh, go into um, his uh, educational pedigree or, or mention the fact that he's a fellow of the AGU and the American uh, Meteorological Society, as well as an officer of the Order of the British Empire. But what Brit he really wanted me to tell you is that um, he's still trying to figure out um, what he's going to do when, he's grow when he grows up because he's on his third career. The first career was that of a scientist. Um, uh, he's well known for uh, having originated um, a, the simple biosphere model, SIB. He was uh, a uh, coordinator, uh, inspiration, and um, uh, practitioner uh, putting into place the successful uh, uh, campaigns of Fife and Boreas. Uh, he then went on to his second career in uh, 1996, uh, which lasted until 2011, and that was as an astronaut. He flew three shuttle missions and did six spacewalks. Um, so we thought it was entirely appropriate um, to have, uh, for the Carl Sagan lecture, someone who has worked in model uh, space of the Earth and also viewed it from outer space. Finally, he's on, well, I don't know if it's finally, but at the moment, he's on his third career. And uh, this is the most exciting one. It's the one as a bureaucrat. Um, uh, he is now the deputy director uh, in the Sciences and Exploration De Directorate of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And he says he will be there at least until the fiscal cliff. Um, but most importantly, he said what he's trying to do there, and I quote, trying to help Younger, smarter people do good science. Uh, and we're about to see uh, some good science and some inspiration for all of us, no matter how smart or what our age is. Pierce Sellers. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, terrific. What did you do with the clicker? Is it? Oh, okay, we're over here. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Sorry about the delay. Uh, this is the perils of going from PowerPoint to, to Keynote and back again. You know, you saw the lights go dim as we loaded up four and a half gig. But um, I think this will be entertaining for you. Today, I um, want to talk about um, comparative planetology. Uh, I owe a lot to Steve Graham and the people in um, Earth science uh, visualization area who can do wonders with graphics. This is actually an artist's impression of Washington after the fiscal cliff. <laughs> and you see, and you see uh, tremendous, you know, just a, just a wasteland. There's, there's Capitol Hill, and there's, there's my, my house right behind it. But this is also a tease to get the planetary scientists in here. What I'm really going to talk about is planet Earth and how it's changing and how we're in somewhat of a race to understand it faster than it's changing on us and tell people what's going on. OK, you're all familiar with this uh, set of diagrams. Uh, when I was born, there was about 2.5 billion people uh, on the planet. From that, from that unkind, people can work out how old I am. Um, now there's 7 billion. Uh, the uh, curves of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide and methane are linked directly to that. Not a mystery. Those things you would expect to be linked directly to industrial activity. The business of temperature change is a rather more subtle and complex business. But it seemed to be going up like a ski slope, just like everything else. And connecting the top graph to the bottom graph is really what we're all about. This is uh, the GIS record going from the, uh, really through the 20th century. And as you look at the pattern of global warming, you can see how the prediction is and the, model, and the uh, observations, these are observations actually, show how it's uh, warming over the continents, first of all. And as you get into the last part of the 20th century, as predicted, you get uh, accelerated warming near the, the uh, North Pole. This is entirely consistent with what all our models tell us. It's closely linked to sea ice albedo. 
And here we go, a God's eye view of the North Pole. This is from a microwave instrument, record going all the way back to 1979. And you can see the sea ice extent in uh, millions of square kilometers there as the seasons go by. And it's rattling along quite happily until you get to uh, about uh, the last decade. And then you see it whipping down. There you go, 2007, a minimum, a little bit of a recovery. And then 2012, actually the, the star is a little bit lower, but that's all we had time to put in there. But you can see that a, an enterprising postdoc could probably kayak all the way through from uh, Greenland to, to Alaska if they wanted to do that. And we can look forward to an ice-free pole in the summer in the next 20 or 30 years, going by this kind of trend. Uh, let's pick on a glacier. This is Columbia Glacier in Alaska. You can see Russia from there. And you can, <laughs> and you can see the, the retreating, look at that, just gone. But you can also see on a couple of cold years, uh, you get a, a, a sort of skim of ice back over the bay, and then a, but a steady trend of retreat. And this is consistent across all the glaciers that we've been observing around the world. Landsat data. So the rate of change is going a little bit faster than our models predicted, and this is worrisome. Uh, we're kind of almost always fighting the last war when it comes to model development and model design and construction. This is actually a little bit out of date. There's an updated version of this slide, so before a couple of people jump up at the back of the office and start chucking tomatoes. But the, uh, the revised slide pretty much shows the same thing. The model predictions are the middle white fat line. That's the mean of about 13 model predictions of the uh, sea ice extent in the polar region. And you've got a standard deviation up and down from that. And check out the observations. They are sort of rocketing down there compared to the, uh, the prediction. So something is not going right. We are undershooting consistently with our models. There's been some improvement in AR5 on this but we still have the same problem. We're undershooting. So further change is inevitable. Why is that? We've got lots and lots of people. This is the eastern seaboard of the US at night. You can see my house from here. Um, just look at all these people. And the point is that the whole world is looking to this economic model to uh, basically be their target. So we have 7 billion people on the world now. We have 10 billion in the next sort of 20, 30 years. OK, this is the predicted um, population density on the planet as per sort of census extrapolation and model extrapolation. You can correlate that with the city lights that we see from space. Very close correlation. And you can see in the um, countries China and India, two good examples, uh, where economic development is going to drive energy consumption further upwards as we go, as a combination of the uh, sort of census type projection and the city lights. One to one correlation, pretty much, of who's where and who's doing what. So, where does this, where does this place us? Um, the biggest uncertainty about what's going to happen to the forward projection of air temperature on planet Earth is not connected with our model uncertainty at this stage. We've kind of crossed over a boundary there. Our models are doing quite well. They agree more or less. Uh, the biggest uncertainty is what we're going to do, our future energy policy. And if you look at these projected temperature curves, the, uh, these are the means of all the um, uh, models in the assessment. The bottom line is if we all uh, basically stopped consuming um, power immediately after I finish this talk, because I want to finish this talk, and you all walked home and uh, ate cold dog food. Uh, so that would be the bottom line. It would kind of rather bleak future. The red line is business as usual. Uh, we keep doing what we're doing. And in fact, we keep doing more of what we're doing with the extra people. So that takes you up to a pretty frightening four degrees or something in some cases, four degrees centigrade uh, in the not too distant future. And the bits in between are the bits in between which is likely where we're going to end up, but we're not sure exactly what kind of trajectory we're going to have. But it's going to be, hopefully, lower than the red line, and it certainly can't get lower than the, the, the yellow line. 
So, why are we in a race? Nope. This is going to appear by itself, Steve? No. Oh, too bad. Why are we in a race? Well, the race, the reason is um, the planet's changing pretty much as fast as we're learning how to model it. So in terms of the challenge to the modeling community and the observation community is to try and keep up with all the things that we learn, all the extra wrinkles, and make the models credible enough to give you uh, decent projections that are convincing to the public and politicians. Why bother? OK. So the global economy and most people's hope for the future is entirely dependent on cheap, available energy. And damn it, the whole rest of the slide went away. <laughs> uh, OK, AGU, you'll be hearing from my lawyer. That's right. <laughs> but bottom line is you go through um, the logic uh, you have. Let's see, it go back. Let's try and go through the logic. Maybe it'll come back. So people want to live better. And there's going to be 10 billion of us, extra 3 billion people needing access to food and fresh water. So that's quite an additional stress on an already stressed system. Okay. Thank you. You can imagine, however, uh, that's going to be one challenge enough. If you had a perfect political system and everybody agreed on everything, you could probably pull it off without too much stress. Feed and water an extra 3 billion people at peak population. But that's probably unlikely, and so you can expect that inequities in access to food and water and other resources could be politically destabilizing. That's undesirable. So public and politicians have got to be convinced about the causes and the likely effects of climate change before they take any potentially disruptive actions to try and fix this problem or at least uh, get a series of fixes in place. And for this to happen, they've got to believe the models. They have to believe the models. So it's our job to make the models as credible as possible. And how are we going to do that? All right. How are we going to do that with uh, these slides? <laughs> so, so, so model credibility is absolutely essential. Otherwise, we won't do anything about it. And that means we've got to continuously verify and improve the models. OK. So improving and verifying the models. Now I'm going to try one more push. Ah. Oh, great. Good. There's three things we can do to improve the models. One is um, just brute force, uh, better dynamics. Uh, that means higher resolution and more computing power. Good. We have that. And in fact, it turns out that just improving the resolution of models gives you orders of magnitude better performance in terms of realism. You start resolving processes and things that are going on in the world's atmosphere that you just cannot do at coarse resolution. So this is a, a huge gain if you could pull it off. All right, second thing, I'm going to go back. That work part's working. Bink. I keep banging away at my button. OK, second thing. Let me just go back one. I'll make the shopping list first, then we'll go through them one by one. So better dynamics, that's computing power and resolution. The second thing is better physics and parameterization. Um, and that means all the little processes and uh, sort of sub-modules of, model of the uh, computer models. And the last thing um, is verification. And for that, you need in-situ data, satellite OBS, and field experiments. And we're going to whip through all those things in, in series. OK, here we go, first of all. Resolution. So this, when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s, this is what the world looked like. But as we got better computers, it started to look like this. Around about the 90s, we're up here. And towards the end of the 90s, we're sort of doing this. And now the world is looking more and more less like a toy world and more like a real world. And now we're doing runs at something, you know, less than 30 kilometers all the time for climate models as well as weather models. So a huge improvement in realism. This is the kind of thing you can do. This is aerosols, um, different sources of aerosols, produced through uh, analysis in the, uh, one of the NASA models. And it's really impressive. You can see the different sources of aerosols. This sort of orange-yellow color is dust coming off the world's deserts. The uh, smoky green stuff is biomass burning. 
the bluish stuff in the southern hemisphere mainly is sea salt, and the white stuff is mainly um, industrial activity, sulfates and things like that. So you can see it blowing off uh, the Chinese industrial basin, bits of Europe and the east uh, side of America, but also a volcano in South Africa is uh, contributing a little bit to that. So this is analyses done at very high resolution, 10 kilometers, and it pretty much looks like the real world. When you do it with other things, like you know, climate variables, clouds, you've got an increase in realism um, compared to what we used to do with a sort of four by five degree models where cloudiness was just haze or no haze for your entire grid square, you're actually resolving cloud processes and dynamics. Uh, this is another simulation. Again, looks like the real thing pretty much. Uh, very convincing. You can see the cloud streets coming out from an um, outflow off the uh, Asian mainland. Planetary scale waves. All the embedded convection, the lot. It's your own little planet. Beautiful. OK, better physics and parameterization. So what have all of us been doing over the last 20 years, all the rest of you who weren't um, otherwise engaged? Lots of progress. Weather models are basically you know, the, the sort of Siamese twin of climate models. And in some cases, in some institutions, they use the weather model as the climate model. But European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast has basically done a sort of analysis of how well they've been doing since they got started in the uh, early 80s. And here you can see basically the improvement in the prediction of the 500 millibar height over the period 1981 to 2011. And if you read all the fine print, basically what it says is that our uh, used to be that the three-day forecast um, was uh, the best thing they had. Now we do the same thing out to five days in terms of performance. Seven days is the, uh, the new seven days is the old five days. Ten days is like the old seven days. So we're basically making a gain of something like a day in skill in weather forecasting per decade. Some of this is due to better resolution. Some of this is due to better uh, you know, pulling in of data. And some of it's due to better parameterizations. And this is rainfall prediction. Rainfall is like one of the hardest things to do, or precip's like one of the hardest things to do in a model. And again, there's been some significant gains. This is the improvement. Uh, the number of days in, in, ahead in predictive skill you're getting with rainfall prediction over the last 12 years for European Center. Okay, so the evolution of Earth system models. Oops. Damn, it's not going to work, and this one's not going to work either. All right, out come the glove puppets. Um, in 1970s, we basically had atmospheric general circulation models, uh, coarse resolution, four by five degrees. Come the 1980s, we're coupling those to ocean models. 1990s, we're putting in land models. And in the 2000s and the noughties, we're putting in uh, biogeochemical cycling models, aerosols, all those other things, all linked together in a completely consistent physical, physical framework. So we've gone basically from general circulation models that were, the heritage was um, weather prediction, that's what they were built for, all the way out to Earth system models, which are giving us a, a, a combined, consistent, interdisciplinary view of where the Earth is headed. Uh, oh, glad this one worked. And we're learning quite a lot about how models perform as part of this process. This is a, um, a slide from the, the uh, Kohler Group in Maryland. And what they've done is looked at the models that are contributing to the last an uh, assessment of about uh, a few years ago. And so here's the 13 models. Uh, they're predicted, they're predicted um, global warming over the next, uh, up till 2100, I think. And you can see there's quite a scatter. The vertical axis is predicted surface temperature increase. And it goes all the way from sort of just under five degrees down to a couple of degrees. And there's the other axis along the bottom, which is to do with model performance. Let's go back. All right, so I won't cycle through the slides, unfortunately. 
But basically, what you're seeing here is this spread of predictions for the global warming. Now, the x-axis is showing model performance as in terms of how well do these models reproduce the climate of the last century. So they look at the statistics of the last century, run the model free for a century, and look at all the standard deviations and statistics and see how well they do. And it turns out that the models on the far, your far right axis are the not so good models. Okay, they don't perform so well. The ones on the far left are the good ones, relatively speaking. So that's interesting because what it says is that the models that by any objective index are the better performers consistently, or mostly consistently, give us the higher predicted warming. What we're reporting in all the um, analyses and the assessments is the mean of this gaggle of models. In fact, it's kind of, if you're going to take a sort of uh, a layman's guess looking at the data and the performance, the actual warming is likely to be half a degree to a degree warmer than that mean based on the better model's performance. So that's kind of cause for concern. Better verification. Okay, three ways to really check out how you're doing model-wise. Field experiments, satellite data, in situ observations, and I bet it doesn't work. And you can see it all from up there, so we're gonna start with satellite data. And this is the, this is the cheap way to do satellite observations. Be one yourself. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff up there. We really do. Uh, these are all the satellites that are currently operating. Uh, some favorites like Terra, Aqua, and uh, Aura, um, the whole A-Train, and a whole lot of uh, Earth science uh, stuff. And this is the hope for the future. This is the manifest of observations of, of satellites that we're going to launch uh, in the near future. I like the uh, artist's rendition there of EVI. It's like third from the, the right of the top. So it either looks like a Borg or a beer fridge. because. <laughs> because we don't know what it is so until someone proposes. But um, otherwise, most of these are pretty well defined. A lot going on. Oh, terrific. So we'll start with the sun working outwards. I like that picture as a coronal mass ejection. Those things really hurt if you're spacewalking, you know, and you get hit, hit by one of those. It can smell of pork inside your spacesuit. It's really <laughs> it's terrible. But um, you've got to keep an eye on the sun. And there's been a heroic effort over the last few years to stitch together the observational record of the sun's output into a consistent time series. And this is, this is I think, a really masterful achievement. This is nearly three solar cycles, nearly 30 years, of observations from different satellites looking at solar output. And you look at the uh, precision at which this is being done. That's uh, somewhere between 360, 1360 and 1365 watts per meter. Look at this. This is incredible. Um, upshot of all this work is, and a lot of sweat, is that if someone tells you that global warming is due to the sun getting a little more powerful, they're not true. Not as far as we can tell. It's not a significant contr contribution to the recent global warming. Uh, other things that we're pulling down from satellite observations, working from the, the uh, outer side of the atmosphere inwards, reflected solar radiation from the Ceres instrument, you can see how all the stuff, uh, shortwave radiation is being absorbed over the dark oceans, as you expect, and being reflected from the cloudy areas. Emitted long-wave radiation, sort of an inverse, cold clouds, warm oceans, warm deserts. Net radiation, who's got what at the end of the day? Available energy. Now, by the way, from this you can't figure out, from these data, you can't figure out whether you've got an increase or an imbalance in the Earth's radiation budget the observations aren't dense enough or precise enough or go on for long enough to tell us that. But they do tell us a lot about patterns and processes. Uh, precipitable water coming down through the atmosphere, sounding uh, water from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface. So you can see the uh, dense water vapor around the intertropical convergence zone. Sea surface temperature. This is from a number of different observations, all uh, scrunched through a model. Uh, MODIS data, AVHRR, and I think uh, AMSA data, as well as some microwave data, all put in there. Remarkable precision, and this product is in continuous use for weather forecasting, among other things, 
but a tremendous picture of the Earth's oceans. What that? So mystery data. Okay, chlorophyll, coming all the way down to the ocean surface temperature. We've been doing this for a long time. So chlorophyll patterns, I think we've been doing from the early 80s, uh, pretty much continuously. And you can see how um, all the way around the coastal areas, you've got plenty of, of that algae stuff growing. You know? um, and then out in the middles of the oceans, where the currents go around and around, and you don't get much upwelling on nutrients, uh, it's almost like a desert. There's not much growing there at all. It's so all the actions around the coasts and the upwelling regions. If you're a whale, that is. And this is new stuff, salinity. Uh, this is only kind of a year old since we've had these kind of observations from the Aquarius. So now we're looking at the world, the saltiness of the world's oceans. And notice how uh, the Atlantic is a, a lot more salty than the Pacific, as you'd expect. Mediterranean is really salty. Uh, and you can even see the plume from the Amazon flowing out into the Atlantic, the freshwater plume moving out there and spreading out into the Atlantic. So this is brand new stuff. We've never been able to see this before. It was all based on some people dipping buckets up to, up to this point. And now you've got a global pictures of the world's salinity. And this combined with sea surface temperature are really important forcings for all our models of ocean circulation. So tremendous progress. And ice. No, winds. Sorry about that. So this is winds analysis. Um, and again, we really basically use the models to pull together all the different observations to give us a picture of the wind fields. And near the poles, we don't just use the geostationary satellites. We use MODIS, among other satellites, to track clouds and give us an estimation of the mid-altitude winds. So the models are a very powerful way of combining all these data to give us a combined analysis of what's going on very accurately. And ice. So radars, I think I can go quick if I go L. There we go. Bah. OK. Radar analyses of ice velocities, I know it looks like lemmings, but it's not. This is uh, basically ice velocities around Greenland. And you can see how the uh, glaciers, it accelerates as you get to the glaciers anyway, because it all has to bunch up to get out through the, the exit ports on the edge of the island. But uh, we've seen an acceleration in the glaciers on Greenland, mainly as the meltwater is now trickling down through the cracks and the glaciers getting between the bedrock and the bottoms of the glaciers, and they're speeding up a little bit. So we're getting a, uh, an increase in outflow. And using GRACE data, we can see how we're doing. So this is a method of actually weighing the amount of ice on top of Greenland or Antarctica. And uh, here we're looking at the downtrend in mass on the ice mass on Greenland over the last decade. It's a remarkable measurement. You can see how in the winters you've got a bit of an accumulation. The summers you've got the melt, as you'd expect, and the carving off of icebergs into the ocean. But a very strong downward trend. Something we never had or even dreamt of uh, 20 years ago. I guess a remarkable achievement, I think, for uh, engineering and science. Chlorophyll on the land. Now, all these data sets have been sort of um, produced from the mid-90s onwards in the kind of quality that I've been showing you. But we're learning more and more as we go along. And now we're, I think, on our sixth reprocessing of the MODIST Earth Science satellite data. So, for example, this is aerosol optical thickness uh, over a few years has got the difference between aerosol optical thickness as derived from the MOSA, the uh, MISA, and the MODIS, easy for me to say, the MISA and the MODIS instruments the first time we did it. And there would have been another slide that showed whoosh, that all straightened out. On the sixth sort of time run through, as we reprocess, we get much better performance. And uh, we're continuously doing this. So as, as, at the same time we're pulling in new satellite data, we're going back to the very beginning of the record as we learn new things and reprocess the whole string forwards. 
Okay, last of all, field experiments. Uh, it's boring sometimes to be in the lab. It's good to get out and about and see what's happening and actually check out your, your models and your observations out there. And uh, there's a well-trodden path here for the land surface field experiments. You try and get your, your uh, postdoc who's interested in the process down at the tree or the mosquito level down there. And then you kind of, you would have seen a wonderful sequence of building up to different scales, <laughs> all the way up to the satellite scale. But the point is that there are a, a range of techniques that we've developed over the last 25 years that allow us to do this, to basically take understanding of things that are going along at uh, you know, the sort of lab student level observation of a few meters, all the way up to regional levels. We use flux aircraft, remote sensing aircraft, towers, uh, all kinds of sounding instruments, and make, make all these things work together. It's quite remarkable. So we now have a technique basically been beaten flat over the last 25 years that help us validate uh, these uh, physical parameterizations that we have in models and go from very small scales up to large scales. And here's some sort of, uh, you know, hey, mom, look what I'm doing pics from different field campaigns. What we started to use is um, Global Hawks, uh, unmanned vehicles. These are terrific because you can get a, a very... Uh, a light and slender student into the front of that thing to, to run all the instruments. But, and he doesn't mind a bit, you know. Um, but the remarkable power of these things is you, they've got flight durations of up to 36 hours. You can send them out to go and look at hurricanes. They don't get bored. They can even drop sons and things like that in the middle of hurricanes and load them up with all kinds of um, remote sensing instruments. And the work goes on down at the surface. We have people you know, this year, working in Siberia, out in the ocean, doing little field campaigns and local studies on things like uh, leaf photosynthesis and leaf nutrients, down, right down at the sort of leaf level scale. And uh, I think there's a picture on the bottom right of the control room aboard the Canor, where they're uh, doing, doing uh, salinity observations. Problems. I bet this doesn't work, Steve. What do you think? You want to bet? All right. <laughs> problems. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. There are five classes of problems. <laughs> um, the five classes that, that, that I've tried to bin things into are the known unknowns. So things that we're aware of that we would not need def uh, more definition on. So the known unknowns. Definite problem. And most of us concentrate most of our effort on those things. There's surprises. I'll talk about that a little bit. There's the problem of predictability. There's a problem of the continuity of observations, which is a technical problem. We'll get into that. And then last of all, there's the unknown unknowns. And I want to spend a little time on that. There's the things that we don't know about, we really don't know about how the system's going to work. Well, the known unknowns, I'm going to come back to this picture. The biggest known unknown is what are we going to do? What's humanity going to do? How are we going to respond <clears throat> to the situation we find ourselves in? And that depends on a lot of things. It, it depends a little bit on science. It depends a little bit on what we uh, find out and what we can tell people. But a lot more uh, things have to happen after that for uh, us to pick a trajectory out of that that becomes a political and um, a social problem. Surprises. You can't let your guard down. Uh, we get surprised by the observations all the time. The models aren't perfect, far from it. So you have to keep looking. And uh, we have a methodology and the hardware and the people in place to do that. Thank goodness. So, you know, the uh, space assets came along in the nick of time for us to be able to observe and be on the watch for surprises. It's... Predictability. This figure looks a, a, a little pedestrian, a little dull, but basically it shows the predicted carbon flux for the permafrost regions uh, from now until I can afford to retire in 2200. And basically the bottom lines, the ones below the uh, axis, uh, are the predict is the predicted carbon uptake by the polar region just due to warming. All the plants are happy, they keep sucking down carbon, they grow fatter and stronger, and uh, the, the polar area gets greener. And we're actually seeing a green up in the circumpolar region. However, 
At the same time, as you warm the permafrost, it starts outgassing carbon dioxide and methane, and you take the sum of that and the uh, added regrowth, and you get an enormous efflux, a net efflux of carbon out of the system as you warm. And that's the top fat line, and the gray patch is the uncertainty. And the uncertainty is due to lots of things, but mainly because of lack of knowledge in our models and lack of knowledge about the future extent of the permafrost thawed region. So this is a real problem. We've made big gains in the physical climate system side of the house. The next challenge is on the biogeochemical side of the house to try and figure out what's going to happen to these huge carbon stores in the north. Um, continuity of observations. We have this impressive star fleet. It's very nice. It works great. It's told us a lot. But it's getting old. All the red dates, um, sorry, all the red uh, names show satellites that we rely on that are way, way past their design life. In some cases, three times past their design life. We've got our money's worth out of the um, Terra, Aqua, and Aura, and A-Train birds. We really, really have, since those guys have hung in there three times longer than they were designed to, or, or, or headed that way. Um, but, you know, we've got to keep replacing these things. So that's a concern. And let's talk about the unknown unknowns. This is Katrina uh, from GOES. And here it comes, right over New Orleans. And uh, I was there at the time, or just a hundred miles to the one side of it. A very impressive and uh, distressing event for all the people living down that part of the Gulf Coast. 400,000 people in New Orleans, 200,000 people had to leave. Um, the predictions. So ECMWF pulled together all the predictions from all the models ahead of time for the, the Katrina landfall. So four days out, a lot of scatter among the models. And I'm afraid I think we've lost the predictions, but they really tighten up. But about two days out, it's absolutely clear that the hurricane was going to hit New Orleans. So the information was there. Point is that was the government, were the government structures in the state and federally at the time, ready to deal and process that information into appropriate action. And I think if you were to take a census of the people down there, the answer would be no. So the scientists, the weather forecasters, on all those people can do a pretty good job of saying directly what's going to happen, how strong the hurricane's going to be, where it's going to hit, but is the best use going to be made of that information to take the appropriate action? And the answer is, in at least one case, so sort of tactical response to Katrina, the answer is no. So that's one of the unknown unknowns. You can't always rely on people to do the right thing at the appropriate time. And that's something that we've got to really keep in the front of our minds. But there is cause for optimism after that downer. Okay? We have got a, a success to point to as a community and uh, as a, in terms of the interface between science and politics. So there was the ozone hole. All right, everyone agreed it was there, and it was a nasty thing. We didn't want things to get worse. So we avoided one future outcome. Well, it's not coming up. So we avoided one future outcome. There's a world, uh, it's a fabulous set of pictures. God, those are good, Steve. <laughs> uh, um, there's a set of pictures that show what the world would have looked like in 2065 and what we think it's going to look like in 2065. What it's going to look like if things keep going the way they are with the controls we have in 2065 is quite nice in terms of ozone. Uh, what it would have looked like without the controls on CFCs is pretty much intolerable. I'd be living under a rock um, you know, during the daylight hours basically to avoid getting burned. And it, did, it wasn't just the Montreal Protocol. That was just the start. That was in 1987, but there were a series of other agreements. London, Copenhagen, Vienna, Montreal, Beijing, and then Montreal again in 2007 to cement this. And it was actually the follow-up agreements that did the work of really reducing CFC production and turning things around. So we're hopeful, we're very hopeful, 
that the ozone problem is at least ameliorated to the point where we're not headed to disaster. So that's one example of where science pointed out the problem, public and politicians brought into it, the controls were put in place, problem looks like it's going to get solved. So I think, personally I'm optimistic. Uh, as a scientist and as a member of the public, I think we can figure this one out. It may take longer to convince all the people we want to convince uh, of the problem, the extent of the problem, and the necessary solutions, but I think it will happen as time goes on because the amount of evidence and calculation involved is overwhelming. The logic is kind of inescapable. So I think we really can figure this out. We've just got to keep plugging away. And just a last word to some of our customers, the people who don't vote right now, who are basically going to inherit the earth, we uh, give them, and I think kind of all of us think we're sort of doing it for them. Thanks very much. Well, we still have uh, six minutes scheduled for this session, and of course we can go a little bit longer if there are um, questions, and uh, I'm sure peers would be happy to take them. It's a little hard to see uh, out there with these lights, so it'd be helpful if you stood up and really waved. <laughs> They're voting with their feet, Eric. Okay. So the question was about paleoclimate. What can we learn from paleoclimate? And is the com paleoclimate community uh, connected to the climate modeling community sufficiently well to get the best bang for the, the buck? Um, I think the, the answer is, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's tremendously rich record of different past Earth experiences there, experiments to look back on. And people have done some of that. I think it's going to become more and more important when we're looking at variations in atmospheric composition. Uh, people have done a lot of work looking at the CO2 concentrations, the variability over the time, the lag and the lead to warming periods. So uh, there is communication. Could probably be better. I don't know. But, um, you know, it is going to require a broad church to, to fix this. And I don't know so, as much about paleoclimate because there weren't so many satellites back then. <laughs> There's that, the leather and wood ones. Yeah. I see a question up here. Yes. <coughs> um, what proportion of the money spent on research and applications like this should be spent on formal research in the communication, particularly to politicians as well as the public? Because that's what our, I think in our previous article was right. Um, the question was, uh, what proportion of money is spent on, on research versus education, particularly education of public politicians, outreach and stuff like that? Well, I think there's a, a, a fixed percentage, and Nick, check 1%, right, of every mission, two, 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 two he's, he's giving me, how many? One to two percent, thank you very much. One to two percent of every NASA missions money goes into EPO work. Um, however, that's the thin end of actually quite a fat wage. Uh, a lot of us... Uh, a lot of the community spends a lot of its time, I think, going to talk to whoever will listen inside the Beltway uh, where possible. And guess what? We get actually quite a kind welcome in most cases. Uh, so there's more and more engagement we're finding from people on the Hill and elsewhere in what we're doing and what we can teach them. So it is a two-way conversation. Could be better. That was it.
soft audience. Go. Thank you very much, Pierce. Thank you.